So I've been chatting with a few people in the last couple of weeks about food banks. Now, obviously the last week or so, the chatting has been limited because the face has been bad. And the has been bad and the face has been like a balloon, so the chatting has been whatever. And obviously the preparation's been a bit like that as well, because um, hasn't been, the brain hasn't been working too well. Um, I'm quite indebted to an article in Resurgence, which is an online resource for these things, by a guy called Thomas Schreiner. Now, it's not, you know, what I've got to say is not what Thomas Schreiner says, but it's quite a useful thing to look at and to read, and I'm indebted to, to him for that. Um, the most common question I've been getting about the food bank we've been, been working on is, how do you know it isn't going to go to those who don't deserve it? How do you know the wasters are not going to get it? And there's very much in our society at the moment this attitude that people who are poor are all wasters. Um, and that's been coming out in the press, and it's been taken up as a political football, really, because certain political parties, and you know I don't make polit party political comment, right? I do not because of what I do. I do not make party political comment. Um, but we are commenting on things that are being fed into our society, and we speak to politicians about what they're doing and saying of all parties. Is that, is that clear? Uh, we, we all know that, don't we? That's where we're at. So one politician from a t particular political party, and this has been on the posters, uh, Edwina Curry of great fame, uh, to do with eggs and John Major. Um, she came out recently in the Manchester Evening News, 7th of Feb 2014, saying some people need to get a grip. Food banks are not the answer. And all she's got to say going on from there is people need to go out and get a job. And obviously she's never had that much trouble getting a job, uh, whereas a lot of people have, you see. So there's a balance needed there. And then there's this lady, Jack Munro. Now, Jack Munro famously lived um, on very little money for a long period of time with a, a small child. Uh, she's actually very high up on the Guardian's pink list this year because she's also a, a pro-gay rights campaigner. Um, but she's got a point to make, which is this. Poverty can happen to anyone. We do know that. Um, their rhetoric of hard, work hard and get on can fall apart in the blink of an eye. And that's true as well, isn't it? Now, where biblically do we stand on these issues? Um, somebody told me, <laughs> a young person told me recently I was very left-wing. I, 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 I think he's in error. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, you, how, do you, how do you balance these things out? We're trying not to be left-wing or right-wing. We're trying to be biblical and have a biblical balance on issues like this. The Bible has got a lot to say about poverty and riches. A huge amount. It's a practical book. It's been an issue for thousands of years. How do we relate to issues of poverty and riches? So anybody who's rich, put their hand up. <laughs> See, that's what happens, isn't it? Yeah? Where do we stand on it? A lot of us are not. A lot of us are not. A lot of us know what it is to scrape on through. And that's great. That's a good thing, in some ways. It's a horrible thing in others. And perhaps some of us have known more funds than we've got at the moment. And that, that's, that's fine. The Bible says all sorts of stuff about those circumstances. And Paul, the apostle, says, I know how to be without, and I know how to, he uses the word abound in the old translations. I don't know what the new one says, uh, but, but you see the point. How do we deal with this as God's people? Here's the question for us today. How do we relate to the poverty problem that's been growing in the UK since 2008? And, and let's make sure that what we say about it and where we stand on it is what the Bible's got to say about it as far as we possibly can. And the problem is a relevant one, it's a current one, it's all over the papers, and a number of research findings are painting a stark enough picture for us. We've this week, and I'm grateful to Helen for sending me the link, we've this week had uh, something come out from the Eurostat, it's called, it's the European Statistics Agency. And it works out, yeah, some of you are looking really shocked at that diagram on the wall, because it's telling you that West Wales and the Valleys, which is here, when you take into account people's earnings and the cost of living, we are 36% below the European average in terms of what people have got to spend and live on. 36% below. That is the lowest in the UK. We are behind Romania and we are behind Bulgaria. Uh, we, you know, we're better off than those two, but we're not as well off as Poland in terms of the available funds that people have, according to Eurostat, here. Now, these, are, these are good statistics, and this is a genuine uh, piece of work. They reckon that people in this part of the world get by on an average of £14,300 uh, a year. 
Britain's so expensive, so families in our areas are worse off than those in vast swathes of Eastern Europe. And there's the EU, EU survey report for it. Now in London, in the heart of the capital, the average GDP per person is £71,000 a year. That's why they think there's not a recession anymore. Because in the heart of London there isn't. But here there is, and we're wrestling with that. I've got loads and loads of stats, and you can have them if you want them, but you're getting the general picture that we are in the heart of this problem. Where we are now, that is a relevant issue. And, of course, the tendency is, especially, I suppose, if you live in the centre of London, or that's your world, then the tendency is to say, well, the, the answer to this problem is to start cracking down on a few of these wasters who are so poor, because obviously they're not working hard enough. Or they ought to get off their backsides and get a job. And we sit in the middle of that. The situation is not getting reported to us in a balanced way. Just to show you about the difference between sort of inner London and where we are, um, there's how you compare earnings in the UK regions. Uh, the one on the left-hand side that's bright green and right at the top of the graph, that's inner London. And the one that's on the right-hand side there, number 37, below Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, is West Wales and the Valleys. Minus 37% of the EU average. It's been fascinating talking to people because they, they, they want to talk to me straight away when I talk about the food bank. They want to talk about um, wasters who are sort of on the dole. And that's the perception of it. And in terms of where the money goes in the economy, this is quite an interesting infographic. Uh, the size of the circles relates to the size of the problem, if you see what I mean, the cost of the economy. So um, benefits over payments due to error, 1.4 billion. Uh, benefit fraud, 1.2 billion. Tax avoided, evaded and uncollected, 120 billion. So where the problem is in our economy, you know, kind of comes out there in that infographic, doesn't it? Um, that's your Amazons, that's your, I suppose, some of the coffee places and stuff like that, you see? Not paying the taxes. And people with a lot of money who are evading taxes in this country. Ta no, 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 it's not, actually. Um, yeah, what it is, there's a difference between the, the, uh, the customs and excise um, estimate and the um, tax justice and PCS estimate. So they reckon that the customs and excise are underestimating the extent of money that's not getting collected in taxes, which would make sense. Benefits unclaimed, 16 billion. Benefit fraud, 1.2 billion. So, you know, this needs to be brought to some sort of balance. And I know we all read the papers, and I know we all watch the radio, and I'm just trying to say, before we get into what the Bible says about this, let's be clear that it's not being reported, perhaps, as helpfully as it might be might possibly be. So what have we got on poverty and riches in Proverbs? Well, let's start with the bit that makes me look right wing, uh, which I'm not. Um, and then I'll try and claw it back <laughs> a little as we go along. Yeah, Proverbs has got such a lot to say about laziness. Proverbs is a great book for laziness. Now, it came out of one of these hot Mediterranean sort of settings, didn't it? You know, where people can you know, enjoy the beach. Well, they don't enjoy the beach because they, they didn't like the sea very much in those days. But laziness is definitely a bit of a theme in Proverbs. Proverbs is very forthright about laziness. We read in Proverbs 24, 30 to 34, this narrative. <clears throat> I passed by the field of a sluggard. I love that word sluggard. I'm going to really use that word such a lot. I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. Isn't that great? I think it's fantastic. He doesn't muck about with it, does he? He's... The lazy person is kind of pictured as protesting. Oh, I need a little bit more sleep, a little bit more slumber, a little bit more time to relax. And it's very easy to see people who don't have a job in those terms as being lazy. But it's easy to be overindulgent of the indigent as well, isn't it? What's Proverbs got to say about laziness? Firstly, it wants to say... That laziness produces poverty. 
Now, I don't know if you realise this, but it is my habit to tweet little snippets from the sermon beforehand. Did you know that? Well, now you know, and you're all going to join Twitter, aren't you? So, uh, little snippets come wassailing out, you see, into the blue. And uh, a head of a big missionary organisation that you could know about tweeted me back when I put this one on the wall, uh, on, on, the, on the Twitter page. He, he, I don't think you're allowed to say that. Yes, I am. <laughs> Here it is. Proverbs is pretty clear that laziness can produce poverty. That's not to say that poverty is always the product of laziness. It's not, is it? Well, I hope not. Don't think I've been lazy. But laziness does produce poverty. So Proverbs 24, 30 to 34, passed by the field of a sluggard, man lacking sense, it was all overgrown with thorns and the ground was covered with nettles. It makes sense, doesn't it? If you're lazy, that's what happens. Proverbs says laziness is, is actually like crazy. It's madness. What are you doing that? And Solomon, I, I reckon, wrote it. He pokes fun at the sluggard. So, so the sluggard, the lazy person, makes wild and hilarious excuses in Proverbs for not working. So he says, I can't go outside. There are lions in the street and they'll kill me. Rubbish. He finds silly excuses. All sorts of, that's Proverbs 22, 13. The lazy person files all sorts of daft and spurious, laughable post hoc justifications for his laziness. It gets more ridiculous. Proverbs 19, 24. This is, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish and won't even bring it back to his mouth. You know? It's a hilarious picture, isn't it? This guy who's so lazy, he won't... But, but, you know, we get that, that sort of idea sometimes. When you go around, you do see people who've given up on ever improving their prospects. And you try to encourage them, and it, it's almost like there's not the will to take the hand out of the bowl and just stick it in your face. You know? Too tiring. To lift his arm from his food to his mouth. Madness, says Proverbs. And you can just see people chuckling as Solomon is reading off his Proverbs. We read in Proverbs 6, a sluggard doesn't learn even from so lowly a creature as the ant. Even the ant knows better than you. Look to the ant, you sluggard. No, he just wants to sleep and sleep and sleep. Proverbs 19:15. Laziness cast into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. Now, the message could be misunderstood. See, we need to sleep, don't we? And we need to rest to recharge ourselves. And some of us are silly the other way, because we just keep going and going and going, and then we're out for three days with a toothache or something, you know, just to teach us to pack it in a bit, slow down. You are laid aside for a while, my son. Rest. I want to rest. Tough. Get on with it, because I ordain it. God ordains rest. But laziness is not that. So, with the effect, this is obviously so ridiculous. In the quote on the slide, the lazy person protests just a little more sleep, a little more slumber, a little more time to relax. What's going on? Well, absolutely clear about this in terms of biblical theology. Human nature has a tendency. And we know what that tendency is. We know that tendency is to choose sin when it has the option. And, and part of that tendency is to reject the work in the garden that God has made humanity for. And decreed that humanity should do. Human nature's got this tendency to that laziness which rebels against God's plan. That human beings should glorify their creator through dignified but diligent work. Why did God put Adam and Eve in the garden? So they could have a barbie? Yeah, maybe. But Genesis 2, 15 to 17, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So human nature expresses its rebellion against living under the authority of the Creator, not by refusing the rest he ordained, but by laziness during the other six days of the week when you put him in a garden to be getting on with it, making it productive. Yeah. Does that make sense? Am I, am I flogging a dead horse or is this, this isn't really new, is it? 
Laziness is part of that rebellion against what God has made, made us for, made us to do, and given us as part of his blessings to us, to be productive in his world. Why are people creative? Why do people love to paint, some people? Why do, why do some people love to mend tractors? Why do some people love to just knit? Huh? I don't get that. More like a hat, but I don't like to knit. We, in, each in our way, we express our creativity and our pr productiveness in the world God's given us. And it's part, you know, it's a great thing, isn't it? It's a blessing to be able to do that. And here laziness strikes at that, and it's, it's, it's knocked pretty hard in Proverbs, okay? Pretty straightforwardly addressed in the New Testament. It's not just Proverbs. Paul writes to those new Christians in Thessalonica. They're working out how they take care of the poor and everything else. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 Even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Don't put him on the list. It's in Proverbs as well. The sluggard doesn't seek to plough in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. So, the sluggard doesn't work when he should. Since he doesn't work when he should, he doesn't get the food he needs. And when he should be working, he's surfing the net, chatting with other employees, or wasting his time on other things. Not all that's in Proverbs. Some of that was application, but you get the point. Now, you've got to bear this in mind. It's not as if the sluggard doesn't have aspirations and dreams for his life in Proverbs. He is full of desires and longings. He'll tell you about it. He spends his days dreaming about what he'd like to do. His dreams and desires are, as, are like as big as the sky. Proverbs 13, 4 says, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. Because he's being lazy about it. He longs for the good things in life, but he refuses to work for them. Laziness wants it badly. But it doesn't act. I've managed to avoid. There's one of those talent shows back on the telly, isn't there? Is there? X Factor or... Britain's got tat or something? What? No? Great. I'm really glad you don't know about it. <laughs> I don't know that. Well, the issue is this. You get these interviews, don't you, with people, you know, as they get on, and I really want it. And they, they make this, oh, I really want to get, I really want. And they're all about what they want. But, well, well, want is good, but work gets there. And they're all really bad anyway, yeah. Well, you know. I can't comment on that, Caleb. It wouldn't be safe. But, uh, but you know, it, it's an issue, isn't it? I want, I want, I want. Well, show me. Do the work. The sluggard, in Proverbs, is always looking for a handout and desires without work are worthless. So Proverbs 21, 25 to 6. The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labour. Shall I say that again? The, the, the desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labour. That's Proverbs 21, 25 to 6. Got to watch it, haven't we? Just need to be realistic about it. Just need to be realistic. The sluggard is always looking for a handout, asks for help. We need to be realistic about that when we're trying to help people. I'd still rather get caught every now and again than have people not get the help they need. But we've just got to be aware of that and try and be sensible with the resources that God gives for helping those who actually need stuff. The Bible actually goes further. It says, laziness easily equates to theft. Proverbs 18.9, whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. I think it's a marvelous memory verse. I remember learning that in my first year or so as a Christian. Um, whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. It's Proverbs 18.9. And 9 is half of 18, which is the easy way to remember. Okay. Easy way to remember the verse. And the lazy person might say, I'm not doing any harm, I'm just chilling out, I'm just, you know. But the idea here is that the lazy rob others even if they don't know it. It's ethically unacceptable in work, but it's ethically unacceptable in the world. There's a God, Godward element to this thing too. God has made mankind in his image in a certain place in creation to glorify God by my labour. And laziness easily equates to robbery from God. I'm taking up his space. I'm using up his resources. We'll look a little bit more at that idea in a short while. But look, there's just a balancing thing I need to say. There's an important point to make here in our current context, in our current situation. I don't often get to quote from Malcolm X. Have you heard of Malcolm X? Malcolm X was a black rights campaigner about the time of Martin Luther King, but instead of being sort of 
liberal in the American political system. Martin, uh, Malcolm X was pretty much a communist. Caleb? I don't know, Caleb, because the X-Men movies are not that good. And he says this, if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. And that seemed pretty much one for our tabloid press at the moment. And for some of our politicians too. So be careful of that. There is this whipping up against people who actually have a spiritual problem. And that's not the answer. The answer is to correct the spiritual problem, to restore people to the creativity and the productiveness that God has made us for in his creation. Does that make sense? It's got to be part of the package. Uh, yeah. You're bored of that, aren't you? Let's come to the bed a bit. The second thing poverty and riches in Proverbs has got for us is this. God's blessing makes rich. God's blessing makes rich. Now that works in two ways. It works for people who've got money. And it works for people who haven't. Here's how it goes. Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. Now that's an interesting little rider, isn't it? The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. So often the way we, we, what we think of as being riches then, has got a price to pay for it. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. Riches from God are not a curse, but a blessing. And let's be honest, you know, having wealth is not in itself something to feel guilty about. I've had friends in the past who felt guilty because they got loads of money. And there have been times in the past, and I'm not going to mention any names or places or circumstances, but, but I, I'd say, they said, well, you know, and I'd say, yeah, great. It's done what we do with it. What I do with what I've got, what you do with what you've got. And you can almost see, from time to time, I've almost seen friends go, <laughs> of course. 1 Tim 6 says that God has given us everything richly to enjoy. Now we don't hold to the health and wealth gospel, but we do rejoice in the good things that God gives us. And if we have wealth and it's the gift of God, then thank him for what we have. Yeah? There's more to say about it, the Bible balances the principle with other concerns and so on. But as Proverbs 15 6 says, in the house of the righteous there is much treasure. There are advantages to having a bit if we use it that way. Riches bring some temporary security in life. Proverbs 10, 15 A rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. But there's more to say about it. Because this blessing from God often accompanies hard work. Proverbs 28, 19 Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. The diligent worker is the one who prof prospers. They plan, they, uh, they, they work it through. They, they know, well, Proverbs 27. Know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds, for riches do not last forever. You've got to stay on top of it. And does a crown endure to all generations? When the grass is gone and new growth appears and the vegetation of the mountains is gathered, the lambs will provide your clothing and the goats the price of a field. There'll be enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household, and maintenance of your girls. I thought that last bit was rather sweet. The maintenance of your girls, right? Take care. Be diligent. The wise worker knows the condition of the business and considers what will bring a profit in the future. And as one author says, to build business and build savings and build real wealth, spiritual as well as material, that requires patience, that requires sacrifice. That's hard work. The blessing often accompanies hard work. But, but, but that being the case, Proverbs says, wisdom will also want to work for its wealth. Wisdom is not looking for get-rich schemes, money-for-nothing schemes. You know, these, these um, emails you get from Nigerian princesses who suddenly need your help to transfer money around the world. Yeah, in other ones, mm, no stick long enough, is there? It's one of the principles of Proverbs. Proverbs 20, 21. An inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. How many times do we see that? We see parents who work really hard over a lifetime and they, they commit what they've got to their kids and the kids have always had everything they needed and they haven't got work in them. Down the panic goes. There was a principle I read about a few months ago that said wealth usually lasts about three generations. 
It's this principle. An inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Proverbs 20, 21, also quite memorable. So, <clears throat> the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. That's Proverbs 21 again. Okay, Proverbs is going to go on from there. Because it has this kind of principle lurking in the background all the time. God's blessing makes rich. It says turning wealth into riches needs compassion, requires compassion. Now, it uses riches in different ways. So you've got to be careful with this in Proverbs, across, looking across different chapters. But those who, are, who aspire to be rich, they have to be compassionate to the poor with what they've got. It's one of the richest things you'll ever do with your money is to be compassionate to the poor. And this is going to sound crazy, right? So you know I'm crazy anyway, but times have been interesting for us over a number of years. But to be able, you know, the week gone by, to be able to, to, to find somebody who needed some food and to take a box and say, You're sad for the circumstance of the person, right? No question. But it's a great joy to be able to do that. Isn't it? That's a rich experience. Proverbs 22, 9. Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Now you'd think, wouldn't you? He's got less bread. He's going to be Mizog. Compassion turns money into riches, wealth into riches. Proverbs 28, 27. Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. It's a complex world. You may need to be careful where you put your resources and so on and so on. Yes, yes, yes. And giving, you know, giving the beggars in the street, you, know, you need to be careful that isn't just fueling modern slavery or crime or addiction. But turning mere wealth into a richness requires compassion. Actually, guys, I'm going to say this. Turning wealth into riches requires Christ because he's the one who, who does it par excellence. He, though he was rich, became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. Remember that? 2 Corinthians 8, 9, is it? Something like that. Tell me to go away look it up now and say, you've got to change verse 10. It's not. It's, I think it's 2, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. This is what Jesus does, par excellence, and as we follow him, this is the business we're in. There's a hymn? Sing it for us. No, no, just tell us the name. <laughs> and all splendour, yet for our sakes became as poor. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember what the next bit is, but about halls of splendour or something, and yeah, swapped it for a stable door or something, floor. Stable thing, part of the stable. Yeah, exactly that hymn, it's a great hymn. And it's embodying that verse, isn't it? When we think of riches, we should think of God, because who gives and who takes away? Romans 2.4 warns us about presuming on the riches of his kindness, for the kindness of God is intended to lead us to repentance, and the riches of God's kindness are poured out so that we will see our spiritual poverty. How is God kind to us? He's kind to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is rich as the second person of the Trinity. But though he is rich, he becomes poor for our sake. By assuming our humanity, humbling himself to death, death on the cross. And when we turn from our sin and turn to God in faith and give ourselves to Christ, we become rich. He enriches us through him and the poverty that he was willing to undergo. Now, we could easily misunderstand what poverty sa uh, Proverbs says about riches and poverty. Proverbs is not simplistic. Solomon recognises that a person may be rich and wicked. Riches are a blessing from God, but they may be obtained wrongly. And that's briefly the third and obvious thing that Proverbs also says about wealth and riches, poverty and riches. God's blessing makes rich, but riches and wickedness can cohabit. And it has a lot to say about oppressing the poor. Violence can bring riches. Obvious. In some instances, people get rich through crime, extortion, and violence. Proverbs 11:16. Violent men get riches, but there it's only talking about money. Yeah, it's not talking about richness. It's talking about money. 
Yeah. And Proverbs has got important things to say about bribes. Now, there's relevant. Yeah, there's relevant. Mm. The world of the mafia or government corruption or West Wales business practices, I don't know, w would not surprise him in the least, right? Proverbs 17.8, a bribe is like a magic stone in the eyes of the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he prospers. Bribes work. Doors may open when we offer a bribe until God catches up with us and shuts it down. It doesn't look so very clever then. Corruption can bring riches. See the same thing in Proverbs 18.16. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. And we all know that those who have gifts can find themselves in positions of power and influence by giving their gifts. We all know money talks. Proverbs 17.23 makes this very clear though. The wicked accepts a bribe in secret. The wicked. The wicked accepts a bribe in secret. To pervert the ways of justice. Bribing, accepting bribes perverts justice, even if it works. So, riches and wickedness can easily cohabit. It's another grim feature of money in this world that the rich often feel free to mistreat the poor. Now, does that bear on our circumstances, our current political discourse? The rich can feel free to mistreat the poor. The Bible's clear on it. Proverbs 22 warns about it. Proverbs 22, verse 2, there's another one that's easy to remember. Do not rob the poor because he is poor or crush the afflicted at the gate. Do not do it and it spells out why. You can get rich by robbing the poor. The rich person may work the market in such a way he makes more money and in the process he's treading on other people. Proverbs 11.26, the people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. If you're trying to manipulate the market by holding back grain to force the price up, the well-being of the poor, says Proverbs, must also be taken into account in business. In Solomon's teaching, the rich may get their money unjustly, they may oppress the poor, but in oppressing the poor, the rich act against God. And here's the big lesson to learn all the while. We need to remember this. Having wealth is not the same as being prosperous. Proverbs 17.5, sobering word. Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. He who mocks the poor insults his maker. I want to take that and sort of nail it on the door of a few tabloid newspapers, to be honest. Send it through the post to a few politicians. Do you reckon they'll open the envelope? Don't it? They'll have some poor intern not getting paid doing that, won't they? Proverbs 11.4. Eh? Hey? Aren't you? Is that government or politics? I mean, like MPs. They have unpaid interns. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, in, on, on the sort of executive wing, you're not allowed to do that. Quite right. Quite right. But in politics, they seem to. Yeah. A lot of other places too. Proverbs 11.4 says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Comfort in this world doesn't mean we'll find comfort in the next, does it? Okay, riches and wickedness can cohabit, but righteousness and poverty can cohabit too. And that's another big theme in Proverbs. Righteous people can be materially poor. There's a whole string biblically of people who are righteous and poor. Think of Ruth, for example, off the top of my head. You know, Ruth the Moabite S. Righteous but poor. Coming back and just getting the gleanings off the harvest, you know. God honours that. Proverbs 28.6, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Doesn't Paul punch his Solomon? He's very forthright, isn't he? You'd think he was rude. The truth sometimes seems to be rude to those who don't like it. Proverbs 19.1, better is a poor person who walks in his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. Are you getting a taste for Proverbs? Proverbs is tasty. It's chunky stuff. It's full veg in the soup. You know. So the current political discourse then about poverty and welfare, it's got to take this important thing on board from Proverbs. Poverty is not always due to laziness. That's clear, isn't it? 
clear in the Bible. It's got many causes. Proverbs 15, 16 to 17. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Oh, that's one to learn. Proverbs 15, 16 to 17. Are you going to forget that? You know where to look for it when you forget the words, then you? 15, 16 to 17. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Tell me that's not relevant in Wales. So Proverbs isn't teaching that all who are poor are lazy and sluggards. In fact, Proverbs in particular, the Bible in general, teaches us the opposite. Poverty can come from oppression and all sorts of other circumstances that are not under our control. Very often, blessed are the poor. People who make comfort and riches their God, very often disappointed they've set their hearts on something that doesn't bring them riches what does firstly it's about garnering God's garden it's the stuff about the garden and the creation and the place in it we have being creative and productive in some way because that's riches in itself isn't it that helps us we've got to eat and so on and so forth but blessedness riches are decreed by God in return for garnering God's garden, you see, the point, the plan, the purpose, the place of happiness and wholesomeness lies in doing your part in God's creation. God has ordained productive work for mankind. And that's got implications then for those who lack it and want it. As well as for those who rebel against God's purpose and reject productive work they could have. Simply giving food to poor people is then not an adequate response in itself. Unless somehow that creativity and that whatever can be added to the mix. Do you see what I'm trying to get at and say here? It's not enough. It's great, it's not enough. People need a creative... What's the word I can use for this? We have this role that's given us by God in our world. It's by creation, not even by grace. It's by nature of who we are as human beings. And it's an important part of richness. In our, in our life, in our experience of the world. That's got implications for the, for the current debate, I think. But assuming that work has been found that is profitable, the Bible's teaching about poverty and wealth is, secondly, about being God's good steward with all the stuff you've garnered. Feeding the system, reinvesting in the business. The Bible talks about several responses to good things we've got. It talks about righteous rich stewards so biblical examples of righteous rich stewards would include Abraham Isaac Jacob Joseph Job this is a surprising one but it's true Joseph of Arimathea who was rich and had a very fancy tomb which he let Jesus use for a bit didn't need it for long mercifully Lydia you know great righteous person righteous steward rich used it well Funded much of Paul's ministry by the look of this. Dorcas, who often helped the poor. Righteous, rich stewards. It has righteous, poor stewards. Righteous, poor stewards. Well, we mentioned Ruth and Naomi. The Lord himself. The widow who gave her might in the temple, the little copper coin. The Macedonian church who contributed to the needs of the saints in Jerusalem, who out of their poverty contributed. Paul. You want and hunger a righteous poor steward then you get unrighteous rich stewards biblical examples of unrighteous rich stewards of what God's given Laban Esau Nabal Haman the rich young ruler Judas Iscariot oh yes and then unrighteous poor stewards as well the poor are not in, in themselves righteous in scripture the sluggard in Proverbs the fool Repeatedly renounced throughout the book of Proverbs. There's the word you were looking for. Conclusion. <laughs> yeah, it's not as easy as that to come to a conclusion, is it? You've got to come to a balanced conclusion. Riches is godliness. With whatever it is you've got. That's the message. Proverbs 37, uh, 30, <clears throat> let me start again. Proverbs 30, verse 7 to 9, right? That's better. 
It captures how we respond to riches and poverty. It goes like this. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. I don't want unjust ways to wealth. Give me neither poverty nor riches because I can't cope with the extremes. It takes great godliness and spirituality to cope with extremes of wealth or extremes of poverty. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of the Lord. See, godliness in poverty or wealth is fundamentally true riches. And there are temptations at the extremes that are much stronger than they are in the middle. Because the trouble is, everybody thinks they're in the middle. <laughs> so I guess we say, Lord, please give us our daily bread. But most of all, we say, Lord, please give us that godliness with contentment that 1 Tim 6.6 6 teaches us is actually great gain. And as Jesus said, you'll always have the poor with you. You can help them if you've got the will to. Express your commitment to God and your reflection of his mercy and grace that he who is rich became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Express it in the way you relate to them. Does that make sense? Boy, that was a whistle stop of a big old book, wasn't it? And uh, a lot of really dodgy subjects in there somewhere. So particularly today, if there's anything that you think, hang on, that's not right, just, just take me up over tea, okay? Uh, coffee or whatever it's going to be. Um, but I hope we've sort of got somewhere into that with a number of the issues that are being raised for us and we're having to deal with, both in the public discourse and also in our experience at the moment as we're starting to try and do a bit more as we get a bit bigger and a bit more confident about trying to help people who've got material issues in their life. It's not just boxes of food. We give you our lives.